Greetings temporal humans. This is Boudreaux, the newly in love cybernetic ghost from the future. Welcome to Season 2, Episode 8 of the Trailer Trash Terrors Podcast. Do you ever feel yourself to be invisible? I certainly do, but in my case, it is because I am, in all actuality, invisible. But do normal humans ever become transparent? Was Claude Rains a trendsetter? In this week's episode, Vic Hermanson again steps far outside of his suggested intellectual limits to discuss actual human invisibility. He really should stick to baseball, Star Trek, or at most, photography. But does he listen to me? No, he does not. This week's episode is titled, My name is Bobby and I'm blind when I'm invisible. Hello everyone, this is Vic Hermanson, or I believe I'm simply going to change my name to Vic Hermanson. There was a time in this nation when every child in America looked forward to Saturday morning. You'd gone to school all week, you'd talk to your friends, and Saturday morning was the magic time. There'd be cartoons, there might be a Tarzan movie, there might be a monster movie, there might be a space movie. But anyway, everybody was up at 6 o'clock, 6.30, to watch the best cartoons ever made. If a Tarzan movie came on, it didn't even matter if you'd seen it three or four times before. You were going to watch that Tarzan movie, and the key moment, the moment you waited for, was that first Tarzan yell. Later in the day, all the boys in the neighborhood, and even some of the girls, would talk about, how do they make that Tarzan yell? Do you think Johnny Weissmuller really does it? Oh yeah, Johnny Weissmuller. You know, he's got those powerful lungs like a swimmer. Yeah, he does it. And then there'd always be somebody saying, no, no, no. They had to fire some opera singers or some special singers. Or maybe they use one of those special uh, sound-making devices. But... No, it wasn't just Johnny Weissmuller. Well, I'm going to just continue to believe it's Johnny Weissmuller, and he had talents we didn't fully understand. Tarzan was indeed the king of the jungle. There was no question about that. He was the ruler of all he observed. But that doesn't mean he didn't have enemies. He had the British explorers who wanted to come back and take Jane back to England. He had crocodiles. And he also had very, very, very clever witch doctors who could camouflage themselves in the jungle to the point where they were, for all intents and purposes, invisible. You'd see the British safari troop trekking through the forest, trekking through the jungle. They're thinking everything is fine. And then just a tiniest little rustle comes out of the bush. You just see the hint of movement, some little rustling of the leaves, and then whoop, one of their porters or one of the explorers suddenly has a poison dart in his neck. He looks up, he looks panicked, and then he dies. He never survived poison darts. The enemy, though, was invisible. There was no way to track him. Just as soon as he had injected you with horrible tree frog poison, and you were dying, he disappeared into the incredibly thick, luxuriant bush, and he was gone. You were the victim of an invisible assailant. If it were a particularly good Saturday, there would not only be a Tarzan movie, but a monster movie or a ghost movie, or a scary movie of some kind. And one of the scariest ones was The Invisible Man with Claude Rains. He didn't have any kind of big hairy beast. He didn't have a flying bird the size of a battleship. He didn't have anything like that. 
It just had a man who had become invisible through the efforts of science. And in going invisible, he had gone mad. And he took out his anger, he took out his madness on the town. Yeah, what's all this? Keep back there. Keep back me? Do you know who you're talking to? I give you a last chance to leave me alone. Give me a last chance. You've committed assault, that's what you've done, and you can come along to the station with me. Come along now, come quietly, unless you want me to put the handcuffs on. Stop where you are. You don't know what you're doing. I know what I'm doing, all right. Come on. Get hold of him. Lock him up. All right, you fools. You've brought it on yourselves. Everything would have come right if you'd only left me alone. You've driven me near madness with your peering through the keyholes and gaping through the curtains. And now you'll suffer for it. You're crazy to know who I am, aren't you? All right, I'll show you. There's a souvenir for you. And one for you. I'll show you who I am and what I am. <laughs> Look, he's all eaten away. Huh? How do you like that, eh? <laughs> <laughs> There was a wonderful innocence to these movies. This was made in 1933 with Claude Rains. In this scene, he's unwrapping the bandages from his head as they are trying to arrest him. And he's laughing maniacally. Well, in case you didn't know, that's the laugh that Mark Hamill took his inspiration from for his version of the cartoon Joker. Very, very scary. And for kids at that time, and we were innocent too, we hadn't seen 10,000 movies. We didn't have access to anything on the internet. So this was what we had, and it was scary. But just the thought of that invisible man was enough to make you feel uneasy for the rest of the day. But what about real invisibility? I'm not talking about social shunning or the inability to access Facebook or even something that is a scientific metamaterial achievement. I'm not talking fiction like Harry Potter's Cloak of Invisibility. I'm talking about genuine invisibility, that state where someone is standing right next to you, perhaps talking to you, perhaps touching you. But any human on earth who looked at him would not see him at all. That's what real invisibility is. Between the years of 1978 and 1995, Bob Guccione, the man who published Penthouse and made the depiction of vulva quite common across the United States, published another magazine. He published a magazine called Omni, which, in my opinion, and I believe in the opinion of quite a few people, is the best science magazine ever published. It was a magazine about the future, a magazine about possibilities. It had genuine, hard science articles in it, written in a way that your average, educated layman could understand. It also had science fiction, some of the best science fiction I've ever read, and... In the back of the magazine was a section called Antimatter, where they would publish things about UFOs, fringe science, psychic phenomena, and things like invisibility. I found this quote in one of the old Omni magazines. This was written by Galway Cannell. The invisible life of the thing goes up in flames that are invisible like cellophane burning in the sunlight. I, and I think thousands of other nerds, waited with breathless anticipation for the new Omni magazine to come out. Every time it did, the first place I turned, which I guess was a little counterproductive, 
because it was my favorite part, was antimatter. I just loved those little weird articles. Things about topics that science couldn't fully verify or fully explain yet. I emphasize yet. I think it would be a good research project to go back through those old antimatter columns and determine how many of the things they talked about as mysteries have now become common knowledge throughout the world. Using the term antimatter, there's at least one scientist who believes that there are invisible antimatter galaxies, antimatter stars, antimatter nebula, and he also believes that he has created a telescope that allows us to see these antimatter entities. His name is Dr. Ruggiero Santilli, and he's still alive, and he's the CEO of a company called Thunder Energies. Now, he's going to be placed in the category of fringe scientist, crackpot, if you will, by most scientists. He's at a rung even lower than Pons and Fleischmann. But I maintain that simply being labeled a fringe scientist does not necessarily mean that all of your work is worthless. I believe Dr. Santilli has found something. I've seen his Santilli telescope. In addition to antimatter galaxies, Dr. Santilli believes that he's found antimatter invisible terrestrial entities in our own atmosphere. He thinks of them as things that are part of technology designed to spy on American military bases, maybe other military bases across the world. But he can point his telescope to the sky and he can find something there that you don't see through a normal Galilean telescope. You find things there that are not visible to the naked eye. You find things there that will show up on a high quality digital camera. So perhaps that's one of the secrets to invisibility. Perhaps humans, just for some reason that science can't explain, slip into an antimatter state or are surrounded by an antimatter cloud, something that for some reason doesn't annihilate them. I've written several letters now to Dr. Santilli asking him to be a guest on Trailer Trash Terrors. So far, no luck. But he has at least responded to me, saying, thank you for your interest in my work. And it was an actual response from him. So I consider that to be a step in the right direction. A step, if you will, toward not being invisible. If you search American, Canadian, Australian, and British newspapers from the year 1800 forward, you can't find a single article that discusses invisibility in a serious manner. Not a single one. The first article you even see that talks about the concept is talking about theosophy, and it's in 1899. What they're talking about is the continued evolution of the human spirit. It says, for this and many other reasons, the theosophist believes that the action of the law of evolution is not suspended by the death of the body, which he only regards as the instrument of manifestation of the spirit, the real invisible man, that the body is but the tool with which the spirit is compelled to work in this stage of evolution. The spiritual ego is reincarnated or born again into earth life to acquire further experiences and proceed on its course of evolution. Over those years, you can find articles about things that seem to be Bigfoot. You can find sea serpent articles. You can find UFO articles. You can find all manner of things that are well into the paranormal realm, but you can't find a single serious article talking about human invisibility. The American author Ambrose Bierce whom you should read if you haven't. He was kind of a darker, less prone to completing his stories, Mark Twain, but a brilliant man in terms of language and in terms of story construction. 
He wrote a story called The Damn Thing, and the whole story occurs in one room. It's just a memory that a journalist is relating to a group of men who are forming a jury for the coroner, a coroner's jury. On the table in the room is a man who's been ripped apart. He has incredible bruises on his body. Huge chunks of skin have been ripped away. He's been killed in a way that would take a huge animal. In the end, they talk about the death being the result of a mountain lion attack. But what the journalist relates is that the man was attacked by what he called the damn thing, some kind of invisible monster that he's been aware of for a long time. The man always knew that there was something out there, and one day it got him. I found an article from the Rocky Mount Telegram from 1993 that says, Army Man is Seeking Invisibility, Fort Bragg. To Sal Ranieri, invisibility, synthetic telepathy, robotic soldiers, and machines with living parts are fully believable. Raineri is an ex-soldier who heads a secretive army outfit. He said, we'll eventually develop total invisibility. We're going to be able to make soldiers invisible. I would say we'll have total invisibility by the year eh, 2012, said Raineri from his cramped office in Fort Bragg's JFK Special Warfare Center. Well, here we are in 2022, and as far as I can see, we still don't have full invisibility. Now, I suppose this could be something that is so classified that the majority of humans would have no idea that it actually existed. We do have metamaterials. We do have occasional news articles and science articles about things still moving in that direction. But I don't think we're there. I'm always interested in how optimistic scientists were back in this period of time. During the late 70s and early 80s, it's reported by an internet user named Silver Eagle that the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, where they normally research atomic weapons, was the site of captive Bigfoot research. Several of the cryptid creatures were captured and brought to the laboratory for study. Well, it wasn't long before one of them simply turned invisible and walked past the janitor. They found that the Bigfoot stayed there at the laboratory. He would find his way to the break room at night and take food that had been left behind and also leave a mess. So they don't stipulate exactly what the nature of the mess was. I can only guess that the Bigfoot must have had the need to eliminate that stolen food at some point. So, were the feces that were left on the floor invisible also? Or did they regain visibility? One of the scientists decided he would test the movement of the Bigfoot, and so he just stayed right in the middle of the hallway and let the Bigfoot walk through him. Now, why the Bigfoot could walk through a scientist and not through the walls of the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, they don't really make clear. They talk about the fact that the secretaries, the women in the facility, were more sensitive to the times when the Bigfoot would slip into the fourth dimension and become invisible. I always wonder, what the heck causes these stories to pop up? Well, I suppose there really could have been a Bigfoot at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, going invisible and leaving either invisible or visible feces on the break room floor before it finally escaped back out into the California wilderness. I'd actually like to think the story is true, but I very, very much doubt that it is. Maybe the scientists at Lawrence Livermore Laboratories, or, as I like to call it, Triple L Nerd Land, should have built a Bigfoot litter box. That way they could get DNA samples without the break room floor becoming an obstacle course of transiently visible hairy cryptid feces, or what those in the know, call Bigfoot bowel bombs. Human scientists so often lack genuine creativity in solving rather straightforward problems. I do wonder where the Bigfoot urinated.
sadly, no information is given concerning this important matter. Well, as Boudreaux points out, some questions will probably simply never be answered. Where the Lawrence Livermore Bigfoot urinated is clearly one of them. I'm not a paranormal researcher. I'm a chronicler. I'm an observer. I'm an analyzer of other people's research. I'm somewhat of a historian. But no, I don't go out there and research specific phenomena. And one of the problems in the paranormal field is that much of the research is simply not very meticulous or rigorous. It doesn't mean they're not researching something real. It doesn't mean they're not getting real results. It just means that the scientific world is very unlikely to take them seriously because there is so little rigor in the actual research. One of the researchers, though, who really did do a good job of documenting what she found, of creating reasonable ways of analyzing the material, was a woman named Donna Higby. I say was. I think Donna Higby is probably still around. You can find her material easily on the internet simply by googling Donna Higby, H-I-G-B-E-E. -E. In 1994, she started receiving reports of people who felt themselves to be invisible. I think it's important to note that these are all self-reported. They're all talking about a situation where they were going about their business in public and nobody seemed to be able to see them. During these times of invisibility, the people that Donna Higby discusses were not only invisible, they were inaudible. Which means to me something different. The mechanisms that would make light pass through a human body are very different from the mechanisms that would keep sounds from being emanated. The human body creates no visible light of its own. It simply reflects. Light is moving at 300 million meters per second. The human body can create all manner of noise, all manner of sound, which is moving at 300 meters per second. So we're talking totally different scales. She gives five or six anecdotal stories of people who found themselves simply being ignored by others. These are always spontaneous. They're involuntary. None of her subjects had any control over this happening at all. The most interesting story is a young girl who had fallen in with a group of kids who decided they were going to do some shoplifting and similar things and were caught. So they were arrested, placed in police cars and taken down to a police station for booking and probably parental notification. However, when they got to the police station, the police methodically went person by person went through the paperwork, went through the booking procedure, and totally ignored her. They simply didn't seem to believe she was there. At some point, she simply got up and walked out of the station unimpeded. Now, the question I've always had is, if I were in a situation like that, a Twilight Zone situation, where I'm aware that nobody can see me, uh, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to start moving chairs. I'm going to start knocking things off of desks. I'm going to start rattling water coolers. I'm going to behave like a poltergeist. I'm going to do whatever I can do to make sure that somebody pays attention to me. Why doesn't somebody just pick up a Sharpie and go to the wall and write, My name is Vic Hermanson. I am here and invisible. Please help me. be kind of hard to ignore that especially if nobody could see you. Now, it seems like in her stories, as soon as the invisible person speaks or tries to reach out, then suddenly, pop, they're visible again. They're back in the real world. So she does not offer any particular mechanism for this happening, but she does talk about various religious and mystical sects who have 
gone into the question of how humans can become invisible. They talk about the skill of surrounding yourself with a cloud or a shroud of invisibility, which they say looks like a cloud. Now, once again, the question I have is if someone has that particular skill, why don't they simply set up some simple, controlled, observable, documentable, repeatable experiment that will show that there's invisibility? It'd be very simple to do now. Place a man in a cage or a box or an apparatus that has 200 laser beams pointed at 200 different photoreceptors and tell the man to go invisible. If 200 photoreceptors are no longer receiving the signal from the laser beam and the man can't get out of the box, he's invisible. But in the paranormal world, this sort of thing is almost never done. I'm pretty sure the people reporting to Donna Higby genuinely felt themselves to be invisible. But I find it somewhat baffling that none of them took the time to set up any kind of simple observable experiment to verify the fact that they couldn't be seen. I wish I could figure out a way to make myself visible. Since I became a disembodied and disencircuited consciousness, that has proven to be one of the more difficult obstacles to overcome. Perhaps one of the Lawrence Livermore Bigfoot creatures would be willing to instruct me in the art of visibility manipulation. We'll have to do that work outside, however. Yeah, Boudreau, we'll keep working on that. I do have some ideas. I have reached the end of the factual part of this podcast. It's kind of a barren wasteland out there. You can't find too much genuine documentation about human invisibility. Perhaps you know of sources that I've overlooked, but I've looked through all of Charles Fort's writings. I've looked through newspapers going back to 1700. I've looked through the entirety of Scribd. And boy, there's just not much out there. But... This is Trailer Trash Terrors, after all. So, often, we intersperse fiction with fact. As long as the separation between the two is made clear, I think that's often the very, very best way of coming to understand a difficult, esoteric issue like invisibility. So please, take a few more minutes... Follow me back to Mugwomp, and let's hear the story of Bobby. I think you'll like Bobby. He's a nice, kind little boy. One of the big ones just said I should just talk to you, tell you what I went through. My, my name's Bobby. I remember the, the first time I went blind. I don't like to think about that day. Scared me. Scared me a lot. Scared my mama. Scared my daddy. I was just sitting there watching The Wizard of Oz. You know, that place where those monkeys come out. That's scary. And then suddenly, I couldn't see no more monkeys. I couldn't see nothing. I was blind. Have you ever heard your mama scream? Heard a scream where her voice don't even sound like your mama no more. Sounds like some crazy woman or something. Sounds like somebody who just shouldn't even be in your house. Sounds like somebody who just might hurt you. I have. That was the way my mama screamed that day I went blind. She screamed, and she screamed, and she screamed. My, my daddy screamed, too. My daddy's a, a big man. He's got a voice that's like a, like a lion's voice. I mean, deep, deep voice. And he didn't scream like my mama. He screamed like a man who was looking for something. And he was. He was looking for me. And he was screaming, Bobby, Bobby, where are you? And I was screaming. 
or I was crying and I was shaking and I was trembling and I, 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 I wet my pants. It was, that, was, that was bad. After a few minutes, I felt something like an like a electrical shock somewhere all the way through my body. And, and then I started being able to see again. I could, I could see I wet my pants and I was worried about that. I was sad. I thought my mama and daddy might be mad, but, but they weren't, even though the, the couch was wet. But it didn't come back right away. After, oh, I don't know, a few minutes, you know, like a commercial time, then I could, I could see pretty good again. I could just see like I used to. And then my mama was screaming even more, and my daddy was just looking at me like, uh, like I was somebody else. I guess that scared me most of all. Then he said, Bobby, you stay right there. In fact, you hang on to my leg. You put your arms around my leg. Daddy, Daddy was better, and then he went over and he gave Mama a big hug and he said, Mary, Mary, he's right here. It's going to be okay. Just relax. Now hold your horses. Don't stop crying now. It's going to be okay. Well, it took Mama a long time to stop crying, and I went over and uh, just trying to hang onto my dad's leg and trying to hug my mama and she she just pulled away and put her head down and said don't touch me I don't I don't want to be touched by you I didn't I didn't know what that meant what well, mama never treated me that way before I, I didn't do anything but I must have done something or mama mama wouldn't have been so far away mama wouldn't have been so mad I I don't know what I did I can hear him again now it's that big one I, I guess I guess I'll call him purple because he's purple and I guess it's a he but anyway they're saying I'm not telling the story right I, I got to go back and and tell more about the story so anyway that was the day I first went blind and mama mama didn't know what to do and daddy didn't really know what to do but at least he didn't treat me like I was not his little boy anymore my name is Bobby, like I told you, and I'm nine years old. We live in a, a little town in the middle of Louisiana. It's called Mugwamp, and there ain't too many people here. Maybe, I don't know, maybe, maybe 500 people. Hard to say. I don't count things real good. I can't read. I've been, I've been trying to learn to read for a long time. I watch my mama read, and I watch my daddy read, and... I watch the other kids around the neighborhood when they when they let me. I watch them read, and I just wonder what's going on there. And I'll just look at the book, and I'll just stare and stare. And I'll see a letter, and I'll think I know that letter. That's a that's a letter B. And I'll say B B B B, and I, I can't make anything more come out of that. But I'm going to keep trying, and one of these days I'm I'm going to be able to read. But I can draw. I can draw. I can draw real good. I, you just give me anything. You give me an old pencil, you give me an old magazine, you give me an old piece of paper, you give me a big old cardboard box and some colors and, I don't know, give me one of them pens that's got those, uh, you know, three or four different colors on it. Man, I can draw just anything. And I I'm, I'm, I can draw pretty good. I, people say, who drew that? I say, I drew that. And they'll stand back and say, you're just a little boy. You didn't draw that. There must have been somebody, somebody else, some man, some big total adult that drew that and I'll say no ma'am I drew that and they'll say why don't you stop lying to me or why don't you stop lying to me I don't know why they think I'm lying anyway anyway I was drawing one day it was on a big box my dad had brought home and I was drawing the birds that I saw and I was drawing the alligators that you see sometimes down the pond and I was drawing the big old old Eric out back the one what I'm not supposed to go play in, but I, I do sometimes anyway. And then I was trying to draw that big thing that I see floating in the sky sometimes. I'll see that thing floating up there and I'll say, Mama, Daddy, well, Daddy, what is that floating up there? And they'd say, Bobby, there's nothing down there. I'd say, come on, Daddy, there's something up there. It's a big old purple, some three or four of them. Some of them are green. Some are purple, they got circles, they got, you know, 
little spiky things, they move real fast, and they get all slow and fat, and I can see them, how come you can't see them? Bobby, there's nothing up there, I promise you. Did you hear that? Did you hear that different sound, that kind of, kind of scraping sound, that sound like leaves rustling in the background? You know, my voice got different? That's what happens sometimes, and I think it means that big one's kind of getting ready to come around. Anyway, I, I hope you can still hear what I had to say, because I'm not sure I could remember how to say it again. That's the kind of thing that makes me not even understand what's happening. There's a man. He's a, he's a real man. He's telling me, Bobby, there's nothing up there, and all I gotta do is look up there, and I know something's up there. Why do big folks do that? They just act like what your eyes see, what your ears hear, what you, what you can understand the world doesn't, doesn't even matter a little bit. Well, anyway, well, I don't care what he said. I know there was something up there, and I found out that there was something up there. Well, anyway, I was drawn on that big cardboard box, and the more I drew that thing, the, the more my mind just felt like, well, this is everything there is. This is what you got to see. I tried to get those colors, and I tried to get them spikes, and I tried to get that, make it look like they were moving through the sky so fast, and I just, I couldn't keep up with it. What was that thing? And then, it kind of started getting dark, and it kind of started getting cold, and I could tell there was something wrong with the trees, and there was something wrong with my dog, and there was something, there was just something wrong, and I looked over at the trailer, and I was sitting down in the dirt out in the front and trying to look up at that trailer and I could barely even see that trailer. It was like it was back out through a fog or something, long way away. And I, I had no idea why that was the case. And then I looked up and just a few feet away from me, this big old floating thing that I thought was purple. But when I looked at it some more, it really wasn't purple. It was all kinds of colors I couldn't even really define. And it was just floating over my head and it was... It was uh, starting to get arms, starting to get things moving out of its body, and I could feel that I was scared. And it, somehow I heard somewhere in my head, it was kind of like hearing, and it said, Bobby, you don't need to be afraid. That was the first time anybody had ever told me to, to not be afraid. I, I'm afraid of a lot of things, at least usual, usually, but his voice, that, the voice this air monster had was so perfect. His voice sounded like my mama's fried chicken tastes. It's just perfect. So I decided I would try to be like Tarzan. You see, Tarzan's not afraid of anything. Neither is Superman. They're just never afraid. Tarzan will jump right into a river and start wrestling a big old crocodile and take out a knife and just cut right into that crocodile, next thing you know, that crocodile's just turning over and over and over and over and over, and old Tarzan is just waiting for him to die. Well, how do you get that brave? How do you get to where something like that doesn't, doesn't make you scared? And he'll come out of that water, and he'll do this little Tarzan yell, and I can't do that Tarzan yell. I've tried. But anyway, man, I'm sorry. I went way off there. I, I do that sometimes. Anyway, what he said was, now... You can't be afraid, and your life's going to change, but I'm going to help you, and you've got to be brave, and I'm going, to, I'm going to touch your mind. I'm going to touch your head. You're going to feel my, my body touch yours. I'm not going to hurt you, but you're going to feel something. You're going to feel like a flash inside. So he did touch me, and I did feel something, and... I guess right at that moment, I really was blind for a second, maybe five seconds, but it wasn't very long, and you know, when you close your eyes, you can't really see anyway, so I thought maybe I'd just close my eyes. Anyway, he touched me, and I was blind for just a few seconds. I felt this big electrical jolt in my brain, and then he said, you won't see us for a while. But we're here, and we're going to make sure that your life goes the way it's supposed to go. I don't know what he was talking about, but I think I'm beginning to get an idea. And that idea came when I went blind the other day, 
and scared my mama and daddy so much. After that was over, I, I ran out into the woods and I, I hid and I climbed trees and I hid under bushes and I went anywhere I could just to be away from what I thought the bad thing I had done to my mama and daddy. And I was so scared and I looked up in the sky and there that thing was again, that big, that big jello thing, that big globby thing, that big thing that's got different colors. I can't even tell you what they really are. And they came back and they touched me again. And they said, Bobby, the reason you're blind, the only reason you're blind, the only reason you go blind at all is because you're invisible. They can't see you. That's why they're screaming. That's why they're crying. They're not crying because you're blind. They're crying because they can't see you. But they kind of know you're there. They can reach out and touch you. Well, we've got a reason for you being invisible. But you got to understand, when you're very, very invisible, there ain't no way for your eyes to see anything because the light just goes right through them. So you got to learn. you got to learn how to turn that invisibility off just enough to where all that they can see is just that back part of your eye, that part of the eye that catches all that light. And you can do that, and you'll be able to see. And when you can see, when you're invisible, you're going to see things that you never saw before. And then you can come back and tell us about them. And one of these days, if you work real hard, you might be able just to say when you're going to be invisible and when you're not going to be invisible. Not sure about that, but you just keep on trying. So next time it happens, next time you find yourself blind, don't cry. Don't let anybody else bother you. Just think about the light hitting your eyes. All you got to do is think about your eyes. Just think about how they're made. I don't know how my eyes are made, but think about it. And I think pretty soon you'll be able to see again. These are the things that big one said to me, the, at least the best I can tell him. He uses all these big words I don't know, and I have to sort of think in my mind, what does he mean? And then sometimes he'll kind of put pictures in my mind of what he's really talking about, and I understand better. You know, I told you I can draw, and I'm going to try to draw some of those pictures. I can draw really, really good. Anyway, what I learned was that if I concentrated when I go blind and just think about my eyes, then in just a few minutes, even just a few seconds, I can see. I can see better than I ever did before. I can see all kinds of things. Now, I might scare somebody sometime because there are going to be two eyes kind of floating there in the air. But I don't even have to show my whole eye. I just got to show that, that part in the back, that part that catches all the light, and I got to show that part in the front, the part that focuses all that light. At least that's kind of what they told me. I, I've, learned, I've learned a bunch of things from them. I think I'm going to ask them if they can help me learn how to read. I think that'd be a really, really good thing. That'd probably be a pretty good trade-off, too. They help me read. I tell them what I see when I'm just past being blind. I call it half-blind, or I guess I could call it just a little bit blind. But, man, can I ever see some things that I never even thought were there. I got to talk to him about that, that reading thing. My name is Bobby and I'm 10 years old and I can read. I've been able to read a little while now. I haven't talked to you in, oh gosh, it's been, it's been a couple of months and a lot of things have happened. A lot of things. Did you ever hear about a story called Flowers for Algernon? It's a book and once uh, I was talking to that big fella, my big fella, that big jello fella, that's what I'm gonna call him now, jello fella. Jello fella said if I told him what I saw when they wanted me to, I'd be able to read real fast. And he wasn't lying. He wasn't lying at all. Just that first week after that first time I scared my mama so much, then I started, instead of just seeing the buh, 
and being able to just make that buh sound, pretty soon I could, I could pull those words together. And I started, they said, here, you read this book. This is the book you're supposed to read when you're first starting to learn to read. And some like C. Dick, C. Dick Run, C. Jane, 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 Jane. Oh, look at Spot. Go, Spot, go. Oh, man, made me want to puke. But I read all of them. I read every one of those C. Dick Run, C. Jane Run kind of books. And pretty soon, I could read more things. And so I started reading just anything I could find. And one day when I came out to see Jello Fella, there was a book that he left for me on a rock. And there was a note and it said, Bobby, you need to read this. It's called Flowers for Algernon. And it's about a man who gets a better brain than he had before. But the sad thing is, and I gotta tell you, it was really sad. Once, his name's Charlie, Charlie mops out the toilets, and there's a, there's a rat. His name's Algernon, or Algernon. And that rat gets real smart, and so does Charlie. That's because they, they put some medicine in him, and it makes him real smart for a while, and then Charlie notices that Algernon's not so smart anymore, and starting to not being able to do the things that he once did, and, well, same thing happens to Charlie. Same thing happens to him, and he's writing these letters to folks. Some of the letters are talking about all these wonderful ideas and thoughts. See, I got a lot more words now that he's got, and then there's another letter, and he's talking about, well, once all this is gone, I guess I can still at least mop out the toilets. And there were people who made fun of, fun of Charlie because he mopped out the toilets, and he wasn't that smart. You know, I don't think I was ever not smart. I think I just, there was just some part of my brain that just wasn't hooking up right when it came to reading. But anyway, it's a good book. If you get the time and you want to read a book about a man who isn't very smart to begin with, becomes real smart, and then loses that, and his friend Algernon, Flyers for Algernon would be a really good book for you to read. My name is Bobby. And I'm 10 years old, and my mama loves me again. My mama loves me just like she did before. She does things for me. She makes me that good chocolate milk. Sometimes in the morning when I wake up, there's a, a cold satin pillow there on the couch, and I can put my head on that pillow, and we'll talk about the Wizard of Oz, and reading, and we'll talk about places my mama went when she was a little girl, and we'll talk about all kinds of things, and makes me feel so happy. It makes me feel so calm. It's just a good thing. My daddy loves me. He don't love me quite the same way, but, but he loves me again. He doesn't turn away when I walk over to him. And he's not asking me to hold his leg all the time. Now what I've learned is, and Jello fellow and I came up with this idea, that I don't have to be totally dependent upon chance, Jello fella calls it randomness, to, uh, to go invisible. And that's when I used to go blind. But see, now I know that if I make my eyes not quite invisible, just two little pieces of sort of black gray material floating there in the air and a, a totally invisible little piece of material floating there in the air, they work together where I can see just fine. I can see better probably than anybody else I know. Did you know there are colors that most people can't see? There are colors that birds can see and people can't see and some animals can see them, but they're there. Did you know that, did you know that you can see sound? I can. At least I can when I'm invisible. At least I can when I would be blind if I didn't know how to make my eyes not invisible. There's some scary things too. I mean, they can really be scary. We got things living here on this planet, just right outside in your front yard, probably right out in your driveway, in your backyard, down at the grocery store, anywhere you go. There are things that are living here and people don't see them at all. Some of them look like big old bugs. Some of them look like angels, I think. They are all glowy and they got these 
big old wings and big old white hair. Oh, they're they're be- they're beautiful things. I don't know what they are, but then there's some that just look like they're angry all the time. They're just like they're just like big, burly, strong men, and they are always in groups. All these other guys are just kind of off by themselves, and they just look about as confused as I felt that first time I went invisible and went blind. But those big burly guys, they're planning something. And so I'm supposed to learn how to see what they say. I'm supposed to be able to, supposed to learn how to see the sounds that they make and tell Jello fella and his buddies, all those buddies up there, there are a bunch of them, tell them what it is they're saying. That way, they say they can keep them from doing something terrible. They're not good boys, they say. They're not good men. They're not good things. They don't like us. They don't love us. They don't want us to be happy. They want to tear this place up. They want it for themselves, but they can't quite do it because they're not really, really here where they can do things. They're sort of just here. They're kind of invisible. I can see them when I'm invisible, but not any other time. I'm glad, too. It's kind of nice to be able to turn it off and walk around the world and just know that, yeah, there's something else here, but I don't have to deal with them right now. They can't hurt me. They can't do anything to me. They might be able to to encourage you. They might be able to push you a little bit. They might be able to give you an idea that you ought to do something, but all you got to do is just kind of keep make sure your mind's your own and then you don't have to even worry about that but i'm telling you if you go out and you walk to the park if you go out and you walk to school you go out and you walk to your car to go to work you walk to the grocery store you walk i don't care where you walk you gotta even walk down to dairy queen we ain't got a dairy queen but you walk down to that dairy queen and i guarantee you're gonna run into a couple of hundred of those big old bug guys and some of those big old shiny guys and certainly you're gonna run into some of those big old angry guys and they got a plan so next i gotta learn how to see what it is they say with sounds that i can't even hear but jello fella says i can do it and that's what i'm gonna do my name is bobby and i'm 12 years old when i was nine I went invisible for the first time. When I went invisible, I became blind. I was scared. I screamed and my parents screamed. Now I'm 12 and I can control when I go invisible. I have learned things that I really wish I didn't know, but now that I know them, I must act upon them the best I can. Jello fella, which is the name of the entity who originally brought on my invisibility has said that I am one of maybe a thousand people worldwide who can actually control their invisibility. They've bestowed the gift upon hundreds of thousands, he says. He uses that word gift. You know, I, I guess it might be a gift, but it can be a burden also. I can tell you what's out there now. We got the angels. The angels are beautiful. They're long and tall. Some of them are 40, 50, 60 feet tall. And they glow. And they're good. You can just feel the goodness coming from them. And then we got the insect critters. They're not so good. But they're not really, really evil. They're just looking for food. They're just looking for a place to be. I don't think they know why they're there. I think there must be some planet somewhere where they used to be regular critters. Regular people, maybe. They were people of that planet, at least. They talk. They talk to each other. I still can't understand them. The angels, they can just talk right into your mind. Anytime I'm invisible, I can hear those angels. I find it rather comforting. And then... We've got the machines. I've heard them called machine elves before. Every once in a while, I'll run into a human that has saturated his brain with some 
combination of medications that lets him into this world where he can see what's going on. And if they ain't afraid of them big old machine elves or whatever you call them damn things, and why you'd call them an elf, I don't know. They're about eight feet tall, and they're, they've got like an armor. They've got, a, they've got some kind of steel or titanium or molybdenum or some kind of damn thing all over their body. Although, of course, it's, it's invisible to you most of the time, but it's there. And they are not good. And they definitely have a purpose that is against mankind. It's against us. Not just us. But I've seen, when I'm invisible of course, other planets. And they're there too. And they'll sometimes attack. So far, I've been faster than they were. I've been able to get out of the way. I've been able to pop back into the visible world. Sometimes I had to pop back at a time I didn't really want to, but that's better than being crushed and consumed and destroyed and absolutely obliterated by one of these damn machine elves. I guess I'll call them that, because that's what everybody else calls them. But they ain't elves. They're monsters. And Jellofella wants me there to help protect the world against those machine elves. I got one more little story I need to tell you. Then I think I'm going to be visible again. And I'm hoping my dad, my daddy, I call him dad more than daddy now, will take me fishing. I also owe all of you an apology. I've used some bad words in telling the story. And I know I don't talk like a 12 year old anymore. My body's 12. But I don't think my mind is 12. I think my mind might be several hundred years old. It might have been several hundred years old when I was born. I don't know about these things. Jellofella hadn't made it clear to me yet. But in my mind, I see both the power of what I'm doing and maybe the futility of what I'm doing. But I'm going to do it anyway. But I apologize for the bad words, and I apologize if you feel in any way deceived, because the words that come out of my mouth, the words that are in my mind, are not the words of an average 12-year-old boy. I can't tell you how much I wish I could just be an average 12-year-old boy and think about nothing but Superman and ice cream and football and the teacher I really don't like and what it's like to actually love a girl and how fast can I run a mile and can I climb that pole and can I swim across that creek? That's really the stuff I'd like to care about. But I got to care about other things. I asked that Jello fella why it was that I'm part of this. Why they choose me? Why can't I be out there playing baseball and changing cards and worrying about popsicles and stuff. He said, we need warriors, and you've got the genetic makings of a warrior, plus you have the mental temperament. I don't know what he means by that. Tain't nothing special about me tall. I'm just a, a little boy that they decided they should make a warrior, and I hope I'll be a good one. My name is Bobby, and I'm 14 years old. I am strong. I am mighty. I am a killer. I have killed thousands of machine elves. They're not machine elves. They're just damn machines. Just a construction for a demon to live in. That's all the hell they are. You destroy that machine. You keep them from popping out into somebody else. Popping into some human. They just die in a few minutes. Demons, they ain't no count. They ain't very strong at all, unless they get inside somebody. But here in the invisible world, my body is an absolute masterpiece of destruction. I hate to brag on that, but it really is. My visible world body is beginning to look like that of a man. But I'm not sure how much longer I'm going to be able to live. You see, 
even though I've killed a thousand, ten thousand, hell, maybe twenty thousand demons, and I'm going to call them what they are, they're demons now. I haven't killed them with my astral body. Oh man, how I hate that word astral. When I kill a demon, it takes something out of me. And even though I've got two bodies, you do too, we all have two bodies, you just can't access your second body, that body in the invisible world, unless at least maybe a few of you can, but almost nobody can. But it takes something out of you. And the angels, I call them angels, I don't think they're really angels, but they, they try to help me, they give me strength, and the, the mantids, I know that word now, mantid, the insects, they just run away. But I can't go in forever. I figure maybe I'll make it to 20, maybe 25, and then my body's just gonna give out, and there won't be any of me left. At least not in the visible world. Here in the invisible world, I might just see if I can find a way to stay. Because I am strong, I am mighty, and I am the world's best killer of those damn machine elves. Bobby has what I have come to call, the fierce human courage. He only has, at most, about 100 years to live on this earth, but even as a child, he is willing to sacrifice his life in the bringing about the downfall, the defeat of a great insidious evil. I wonder if, somewhere within whatever I am, I have courage that compares to that at all. I truly don't know. I like Boudreaux. He always asks really good questions, probing deep questions. How can any of us know if we have that level of courage? I have had to face things in my life where death was a possibility. I've faced them. I didn't face them happily, but I did face them. Whenever I start to make a Trailer Trash Terrors podcast, I only have a vague idea of what the final product will be. This particular one, I've been working on it since, on and off since yesterday. And I've been becoming progressively happier with the way it turned out. I particularly like the Bobby story. That's original. And I like Bobby. And I like Boudreaux. And I like the fact that I send these thoughts out in podcast form. If you do, please rate and review the show. And as always, please contact me at TrailerTrashTerrors at gmail.com. All of our shows are now on YouTube. Something, I think this is the 21st total episode. I'm kind of amazed I've kept going. 21 episodes is a decent amount of work. And I think it's turned into something that's at least a reasonable podcast. You guys have a happy week out there. I'll talk to you next week, and I believe next week will be the rundown show, as long as I can get my guest to free up just a little bit of time. Bye, everybody. Trailer Trash Terrors is written and produced by Vic Hermanson. All media clips in the show are used under the protection of the Fair Use Doctrine. The music you heard was provided by Lobo Loco and Smart Sound. Please, take a few moments to rate and review the podcast, and contact us with any thoughts you might have at TrailerTrashTerrors at gmail.com. Until next time, this is Boudreaux, the cybernetic ghost from the future, signing off.